And carriers would like a clear path and plan for next generation networking, but many industry stakeholders say that's still not the landscape that exists for 5G. What we now know is there are two phenomenons that 5G offers. First, a technological phenomenon as we introduce new and advanced radio access and offload technologies to the network. And secondly, a business model shift phenomenon that is already beginning to transform our product portfolios, expand the scope of our supply chain partners, and introduce new possibilities to monetize new services. Today, TI Now has a pleasure to speak with Tom Keithley. He's a senior vice president of wireless network architecture and design at AT&T. We'll be talking about what network operators need for 5G technologies. And Tom, thanks for making it in. I know you had a uh, previous engagement this morning uh, that was sort of a packed schedule, and then you had to sort of hightail it over to TIA headquarters, so thanks for being here. Well, I did. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for making it. Um, I want to talk and, and just get right into it here about the current climate for the trends uh, in moving towards 5G technologies, and really, have we discovered a clear business case for 5G, and does the technology exist today to support that? Well, just to level set, the actual uh, 5G standard is not going to come likely until mid-2018 at the earliest. So we're, we're right now in the process of defining requirements and beginning the standards work. So at this point in time, there's really no identifiable business case uh, that an operator can use for deployment. Really all the focus is on making sure we get the standards right and that the requirements fit operator needs and then even moving into some trial phases so we can both help shape, shape the standard and get some learning about what 5G is. So that's the focus today. Now I want to ask you um, sort of inside the looking glass or fly on the wall type of question as far as what kind of conversations are you having right now, right now with your technology suppliers, uh, again, in moving towards 5G technologies? So our supplier base is going to be an integral part of our ability to make it to 5G. Right now, though, the discussions are primarily around the standards. Look, how, how can we work together to make sure that the standards come out and meet operator requirements? And then the next part of that is around trial systems. So there's a lot to be learned by trialing some of the pre-5G technology. We really need our suppliers to help do those trials. So we're engaging them to, to help set up these technology trials and gain the learning and help shape standards. Tom, as we both know, 5G is not uh, just about speed. It's a multifaceted technology that encompass, encompasses a, a number of use cases. Can you give us sort of a clear use case or example uh, as far as 5G goes? And I, I notice you have a prop here as well. Well, so let me try to explain really the benefit of 5G from that perspective. You're right, it's not just about speed, although speed is going to be a big part of it. If you read some of the white papers out there, you're going to see a myriad of use cases. I think the NGMN white paper, for instance, has 25 different use cases. You can really kind of boil those use cases into three big areas. One is speed. It's enhanced mobile broadband and the ability to run in the gigabits per second range, maybe as high as 20 gigabits per second. So what we use that for? Not totally clear yet, but we, did, we said the same thing in the 4G environment. Now the other leg of that stool, though, relates not to speed, but to massive numbers of devices, the Internet of Things. And that's where I bring a, an example of a use case. Um, this device is being deployed right now in Atlanta, and it's being used uh, as a sensor to measure water quality in the Chattahoochee River. So at this point, it's a bit too expensive to deploy widely, but one of the promises 5G brings is to enable truly a mobile connected society. And along with that will be the capabilities to really deploy sensors, uh, connected devices that allow us to virtually connect anything. So there's two areas. Uh, the third area is around latency and ultra reliable applications. So if you look at the latency of LTE today, 4G, the air interface is about 10 milliseconds. With 5G, we're going to shrink that by a factor of 10 to 1 millisecond. So that will really enable real-time type applications, the tactile internet, 
a vehicle to vehicle is a use case. Uh, some of the uh, mission critical medical response items would be a use case there. But in generally, it's going to encompass those three areas. Tom, we have, uh, or we're embarking on a network of networks, if you will. Um, 5G requires high speed, uh, high bandwidth requirements, and also for the Internet of Things, um, uh, low powered, uh, low data for those types of devices. So in this network of networks, how are those, those two aspects are going to play with each other? Well, I'll go back to two of the examples, the speed example and the IoT example. So when you get into gigabit per second speeds, we're going to need some different spectrum, and we're going to need very large channel sizes. Think 100 megahertz channel sizes to 200 megahertz. Now that's five to ten times the channel size we use today for LTE. In the spectrum that we have right now, it's just not possible. So we're going to go to the gigahertz band of spectrum in order to get those channel sizes. Now when you get up into that high frequency spectrum, the actual range of a cell site becomes very low. You can think 100 meters is a potential range. So when you're looking at the very high gigabit per second apps, it's going to be delivered through a cell site with very small range. That won't necessarily work for devices that need to be covered by rural areas. So in the IoT side of it, the, I guess the opposition to that is, okay, we need coverage and we need it to be as inexpensive as possible. So you can think about LTE, uh, Wi-Fi, low power networks as coverage layers in the IoT space. Uh, what will bring it all together is a common core that's a 5G design core that's really access agnostic. So truly we'll have the capability to bring multiple air interfaces to bear, but be able to aggregate all the data back through a common 5G core. And that's really the way to look at that. I want to talk about policy right now um, around 5G technologies. What policy constraints are you seeing right now in 5G? I don't know that we're seeing actual policy constraints that I believe are slowing down the process, but I will tell you there are some very important policy constraints that we need to make sure and, and get around, and, and really it's spectrum related and regulatory related. So on the spectrum side, I just mentioned we we need large bands in order to achieve the 5G promise. Uh, right now, we don't have those. So we're going to have to go get high frequency spectrum, and we're going to have to have it allocated in very large channel sizes to make this possible. Uh, so getting the spectrum will be very important. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of these applications are going to require a coverage layer. And if you're thinking 100 meter cell sites, it's really not feasible to go densify the entire United States with that type technology. So we're also going to need mid and low band spectrum to provide uh, coverage for the, the 5G network. Uh, the next piece of that is regulation. Uh, when you're out trying to deploy 100 meter cell sites, that means small cell architecture. So we've got to have a regulatory environment that really allows us to get the deployment, the zoning and the leasing done very quickly. Uh, in addition to that, most of what I'm describing right now, that technology is, is being built. So to the extent regulation either promotes or impedes investment, innovation, experimentation, that will either speed up or slow down what we see in 5G. Uh, operators are going to have to make very large investments to deliver this technology. And it's important that folks making policy realize that to the extent that it, it promotes innovation, we'll go fast. But to the extent it impedes investment and innovation, that will slow things down. Tom, um, I want to ask you how you feel about the U.S. being perceived or not being perceived as a leader in the 5G space. And is, is your uh, view of leadership really more collaborative or competitive? Because I know it's, it varies region to region. Well, when you say me, I'll give you my own personal opinion. It may be a marketing view versus a technologist view. From a, a technology perspective, there's no reason the U.S. 
shouldn't be perceived as having a leadership role in 5G. Now, maybe some of the announcements that you've seen come out of Asia uh, might cause folks to question that. But the important leadership aspect of 5G at this point, it's in making sure the requirements and that the standards meet our needs. And certainly, US operators and AT&T especially have leadership roles in those areas to ensure that happens. Now, additionally, leadership involves doing trials, pre-standards work to ensure we get the technology right. We're also doing that. So everything that can be done right now from a U.S. perspective to ensure we build the right ecosystem, that's happening. I'd like to go right now uh, to our audience, or for our audience, I'd like to go to the Q&A portion of the segment. Um, there are a number of questions that have come through, and I'll start with question number one right at the top. Uh, Tom, if you don't mind, is 5G more seen as built upon LTE technologies rather than replacing it completely? And how does uh, research on MIMO or mass MIMO play a role in 5G? So when, when you look at the way 5G is being envisioned right now, we're, we're far enough along that we believe it will be a new air interface. So it's not going to reuse the OFDMA air interface that LTE uses. It's going to be a different air interface. So while we can have lots of learning uh, and all the benefit of what we've done in the 4G area, 5G is going to be different than what LTE is. It doesn't mean LTE won't be an important part of the ecosystem, but 5G is going to be different. When it comes to antenna technologies like MIMO and massive MIMO, those are going to be absolutely critical for delivering the gigabit per second speeds that we're talking about. Now, one advantage we have is when you get up into the high frequency spectrum, the actual antenna elements get much smaller. So this high frequency is very conducive to building panel arrays that can be used in 5G. Uh, and it will allow us to really improve the performance and deliver the speed in the 5G realm. This is the air interface question that came over uh, just a bit ago that I did notice. Um, answer it as you will. I know you did answer it to an extent before. Please explain 5G technology. Please explain what 5G technology air interface we can expect. So the air interface itself is actually being worked through the standards. And there's a number of different options being evaluated right now. NOMA is one, sparse code multiple access is one, uh, filtered OFDM is one. Uh, and we won't actually pick that air interface as an operator. The standards body, uh, will they'll come together and, and they'll make the right decision on what the air interface should be. Uh, I guess from some of the initial view we have, the filtered OFDM air interface uh, looks like it's gaining some traction here. But just to be clear, that's not finished yet. Uh, it won't be done until the standards work is completed. Now, there's a question that's it's quite specific, so I'm going to really uh, raise this a couple levels. Um, and again, just for the general audience, the question is, how will these technologies impact 5G? And they're talking about spectrum and millimeter wave. I know you alluded to millimeter a little bit earlier, but maybe spectrum, if you can talk about that. Well, when you get into the, the gigabit per second requirements, if, if you want to go to, to speeds in the 10 gigabits per second, 20 gigabit per second ranges, we need big channels. Uh, and just to give you an idea, right now with LTE, we have a, a 20 megahertz channel size. Think of it as a pipe this big. In order to get to gigabit per second speeds, we need a pipe this big. So we're going to have to have 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz channel sizes. And that's just not available in the spectrum that operators own today. Well, where do you get that spectrum? Well, you have to go up. You have to go into the gigahertz ranges, the 28 gigahertz range, the 37 to 39 gigahertz range, and even beyond that. So in order to deliver the performance, we're actually going to have to go use centimeter and millimeter wave spectrum to get the channel sizes we need to, to make this speed possible. Tom, there's a, there's a question on unlicensed. It's, it's interesting. Uh, how will 5G interact both physically and economically? Um, I don't know how granular, granular you want to get with this, but with new unlicensed protocols. So 
How will 5G interact with unlicensed? Well, let me step back and, and give you just a flavor of what we're doing in the 4G space and then how that will translate into 5G. So in the initial 4G launches, we really didn't do anything with unlicensed spectrum. But in the release that's coming out this month, uh, we're going to standardize a technology that allows LT to actually operate uh, with unlicensed bands. And that will allow us to either use the LT air interface in an unlicensed band or aggregate a Wi-Fi air interface with an LT uh, air interface and combine that for, for greater throughput. So right now we're in the process of implementing unlicensed use in the 4G arena. Now as we move to 5G, there's an expectation that we'll have to use unlicensed both to get to the channel size and because that will be the spectrum available. The big difference is we're designing 5G now with that in mind. It's not going to be an afterthought. Uh, it's actually being contemplated now as the technology and the standards work is done. What happens with that? Well, you, you get a much tighter integration, uh, and we, we should be able to use that right out the door when 5G gets deployed. Tom, if you don't mind, one more question, and again, a bit granular, but on the, on, on spe back on spectrum, is there a role for the 600 megahertz spectrum for 5G that to be auctioned off later this year in the U.S.? There is potentially a role. Uh, and the reason I say that is we, we don't have clear visibility to when operators are going to get that spectrum. But it is one potential use case. Uh, if that spectrum becomes available around the time that we deploy 5G, think 2020 time frame, that could be a good entry band to deploy 5G in. Without that, we have to actually go carve existing spectrum, uh, precede markets with devices, do testing at night, and, and some triple indie cutovers to actually get 5G deployed. It's much easier to do it in a clean band. So one possibility, if the timing works out, is that 600 spectrum could actually be a launch band for 5G. So it's possible, but there are many unknowns about the timing for 600 at the moment. So it, it's not completely clear to me that that's what will happen but certainly it could be an option. Tom, I lied earlier. It's not the last question. <laughs> We're getting a number of questions. There's one more that just kind of caught my eye that I think, I think it's important to ask. Um, FirstNet recently uh, released its RFP with heavy emphasis on LTE. Will 5G have a place in the public safety sector, and can you foresee it as part of the na nationwide public safety broadband network? Well, it's... It's unknown at this stage what the first net requirements will be, so I have to disclaim that. But I will tell you, my expectation is that public safety will want to evolve their technology just like we're going to do in the industry itself. So I would fully expect as 5G becomes a reality that first net will want all the features and, and capability, and, and basically public safety will, just as we'll deliver to consumers and enterprises. So while I, I can't answer with certainty, my belief is that they will want to move to 5G at some point in time when that does make sense. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for answering my questions and also uh, TIA's questions and our audience questions as well. We'd love to have you back, and we know you're going to be over the pond in Barcelona soon, and we'll certainly uh, likely see you there as well. Great. Really enjoyed it. Thank thanks, you. Tom. Hope you make your flight. <laughs> Hope so. All right.